The ceratopsoid dinosaurs were incredibly diverse and common animals throughout the Cretaceous period. However, despite what I just said, the group is incredibly weird compared to pretty much every other dinosaur group during the Cretaceous period for how relatively isolated they were. They are pretty much only known from the western half of North America, from Alaska to Mexico. Only one member of the advanced Ceratopsoidea is known from Asia and none from any other continent. I preempted the last statement with pretty much because there were other types of early horned dinosaurs living across Eurasia and there are tantalizing hints of some in the eastern half of North America. However, these critters diverged from the horned dinosaur group long before forms such as Diabloceratops or even the much later Triceratops. Most other groups of dinosaurs during this period of time were present across many continents. Hell, even the titanosaurs, once considered South American endemics, were present worldwide. Why this is has a lot to do with geography and evolutionary pressures, but we're not here for this today. The advanced ceratopsians, everything that lies within the ceratopsoidia group, can more or less be divided up into two huge groups, the centrosaurs and the chasmosaurs. The centrosaurs were an early group characterized by huge nose horns, tiny brow horns, short frills, and elaborate frill horns. The later chasmosaurs, that seemed to replace many of the centrosaurs, were the opposite. They had small nose horns, huge brow horns, huge elaborate frills, and small frill horns. A recent branch has been added to the centrosaurs that offers another route in decorative aesthetics, the Nasutoceratopsini. These guys had no nose horn or just a low bony bump or ridge, huge deep snouts, huge or small brow horns, and small unadorned frills. Convergent evolution, or the evolution of these same traits in different animal lineages, is difficult to prove in dinosaurs or any fossil animals because you cannot test their DNA and their evolutionary relationships are hypotheses. However, a good solid case has been made for this evolutionary process in an exceedingly rare ceratopsian discovered in the Great White North. A lot of North American ceratopsian material comes from good old Canuckstan, specifically the Oldman, Horseshoe Canyon, Two Medicine, and Dinosaur Park formations. However, Canada holds many other Cretaceous rock layers than just these, and they also contain hornhead fossils. One of these layers that are semi-recently coughed up a good specimen is the St. Mary River Formation, a layer that dates to the Upper Cretaceous with some outcrops eroding out of the banks of the Old Man River in southwestern Alberta. It was here, in the Waldron Flats area, where geologist Peter Hughes came upon a rocky snout poking out of a cliff in 2005. Once the specimen's whereabouts were reported to the Royal Tyrell Museum, its crew went out to collect the specimen in 2006. Excavation was reportedly excruciatingly brutal for several reasons. The specimen was locked in hard, well-cemented siltstone. The specimen was sticking out of a cliff one meter above the Old Men River. The excavation team had to take an angle grinder and rock saw to the specimen because of how hard the rock was, meaning they split the thing up into a few blocks to be put back together at the museum. On top of all that, the river adjacent to the dig site is a protected spawning habitat for trout. Oy vey. This is why it took till 2008 to complete the excavation and is why the team nicknamed the critter they found Hellboy. Another reason for the nickname is all the horns. What they uncovered was a nearly complete ceratopsian skull. It's only missing the lower jaw and a bit of the front of the snout. Because of the size and preservation of the specimen, the palate bones plus all the little bones on the underside and back of the skull are all hidden in matrix. Though this noggin is very nicely preserved, the whole thing is also squashed from millions of years of being in the ground and the ground moving around it as the Rocky Mountains were shunted upwards. So, with the specimen back at the museum and fully prepared out of its field jackets and remaining matrix, what the hell did they find? Paleontologist Caleb Brown and Donald Henderson published their work on this skull in 2015 in the journal Current Biology. 
Based on the traits preserved in the skull, traits seen in no other Ceratopsian dinosaur ever found, the team knew they had a new dinosaur on their hands and named it Regaliceratops Peter Hughesi, meaning Peter Hughes Regal Horned Face. The skull of Regaliceratops has a combination of features seen in Chasmosaurs and Centrosaurs. With what was preserved of the nose horn, it would have been huge in life, though not as large as monsters like Styracosaurus and Stelosaurus. The snout was tall and blunt, though the missing tip definitely makes it harder to say just how blunt it would have been in life. The eye sockets were raised from the skull, almost periscoped like hippos and every other horned dinosaur. The brow horns were small, much smaller than the nose horn. The most impressive part of Regaliceratops was its frill. It had a generic rounded frill of moderate size, but the holes that perforated the frill were very small, similar in size to the eye sockets, something seen only in the southwestern Cosmoceratops. The middle of the frill was raised, leading to a single slightly offset diamond-shaped epicipital bone that was placed a little bit lower down on the frill than the frill's edge a very unusual arrangement. The same type of frill horn lines the edge of the frill. Epicipital is the term used to describe the little bony bits that line the frill. Bibbies just had bumps, then they grew blobs of bone that eventually resemble the frill decorations, and then they would merge into the frill as the animal grew beyond skeletal maturity. Before we move on to what type of animal Regaliceratops was, let's see how big it is. Let's see its size. Let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme to get a good idea of just how big this animal would have been in life. Keep in mind that the sizes estimated by the description paper, other researchers, and paleoartists is an average for the only individual known. The genus or species may have been much larger or smaller on average. Based on math and the general size of the skull compared to the skulls and bodies of other Ceratopsian dinosaurs, Regaliceratops is figured to have been about 5 meters 16 feet in length, with a weight of around 2 tons. Not the smallest, but definitely in the running. Thanks, Mr. Man. When the author team tallied up all of the weird anatomical traits of Regaliceratops and put them into their preferred phylogenetic software, they found that Regaliceratops was a Chasmosaurian Ceratopsian. This is despite the adorned frill, small brow horns, and large nose horn, traits seen only in centrosaurs. It was the rest of the skull's anatomy that placed it in the Triceratopsini tribe in a polytomy with Eotriceratops, Ohoceratops, and a grouping of the rest of the Triceratopsines. Polytomy is the word used to describe an evolutionary concept of an unnatural grouping of species or genera in which they all split off from one point rather than show true speciation or branching as in more natural groupings. A soft polytomy would be one that exists only as a way to organize critters and will be resolved as more paleontologic data is uncovered. A hard polytomy is one informed by genetic data and really represents a divergence event of three or more groups of animals. A later study by Jordan Mallon and colleagues found Regaliceratops to be a bit more primitive, being right outside of the Triceratopsini tribe associated with Anchiceratops and Orhinoceratops. Much more recent studies, such as a 2022 study by Sebastian Dalman and colleagues, have found more support for the original classification. Okay, so what does a chasmosaur nested within the very late Triceratopsini group but with centrosaur traits mean? Regaliceratops comes from the middle Maastrichtine age of the late Cretaceous epoch, so about 68.5 to 67.5 million years ago. This means it appeared hot on the heels of the apparent disappearance of the centrosaurs. The only group of centrosaurs to survive to the end of the Cretaceous period were the Pachyrhinosaurs, and they were prevalent throughout Canada and Alaska. However, Pachyrhinosaurs were unlike most other centrosaurs in carrying bosses on their snouts and only two hooks on their frills. It's hypothesized that Regaliceratops diverged from the usual chasmosaur anatomy because it had evolutionary room to do so, with the extinction of the frill-decorated centrosaurs. 
The authors note that the finding of a very old split among the Chasmosaur and Triceratops lineages suggests a few ghost lineages of a few million years at the base of the Triceratops tree and for the many critters within the Triceratops and E lineage more broadly. Interestingly, the 2015 Regaloceratops paper posits that the New Mexican Titanoceratops is another piece of evidence that there are ghost lineages of unknown Ceratopsians within the Triceratopsini group because it hosts many traits seen in both Pentaceratops and Triceratops. This is interesting because further work in New Mexico would result in the publication of Navajoceratops and Terminocavus, both of which place as intermediates between Pentaceratops and Anchiceratops on the way to the evolution of the Triceratopsini group. So maybe not exactly what they meant, but it is indicative that they were onto the right idea. Now that we know what Regaloceratops is and what it looked like, how did it live and what kind of environment did it live in? Regaloceratops comes from the St. Mary River Formation. This formation is not as well sampled as many of the other Cretaceous rocks across Canada, like the Horseshoe Canyon, Dinosaur Park, and Two Medicine. As such, it seems like it's not as diverse in vertebrate animals as the others. However, this may not be the case. The discovery of Regaloceratops in this formation, and nothing like it in any other more well-sampled formation, may be just the indication needed to think better of this formation. This chunk of rock dates to between 71.9 and 67.5 million years ago, which would have been the Maastrichtian age of the Cretaceous, the last chunk before the <laughs> Regaloceratops specifically comes from the top of this layer, 68.5 to 67.5 million years ago. The entire rock layer is characterized by fine-grained sandstone, gray shale, coquina, mudstone, coal, interbedded sandstones, and siltstone, with some carbonaceous shale as well. The Regaloceratops layer was mostly siltstone, laid down by the actions of freshwater rivers and floodplains, which is further proven by the presence of freshwater bivalve fossils, plus plenty of fossils of plants that like that sort of thing. A lot of multi-tuberculate mammal fossils have been uncovered from the St. Mary River formation, like the saw-toothed Simulodontids and Tilodontids, the otter weasel Didelphodon, a possible example of the primitive placental myacids, and even some possible marsupial alphodontids. As I said before, not many dinosaurs are known, but those that are include possible remains of Anchiceratops, definite remains of Edmontonia, Montanoceratops, and Pachyrhinosaurus. There is also the presence of Albertosaurus, Sauronithalestes, and Troodon, though Troodon may or may not be a valid genus. Based on what is known of dinosaur group diversity across North America during this time, it's highly likely that Regaloceratops had a few other chasmosaurs to contend with, as well as a whole smorgasbord of trumpeting ornithopods. Giant ash-darked pterosaurs were the rulers of the skies, while smaller pterosaurs and birds filled out the coniferous canopies. Crocs, turtles, salamanders, frogs, snakes, lizards, sphenodonts, and champsosaurs were the major backbone of these ancient food webs. I would suspect the presence of Oviraptorosaurs, Leptoceratopsians, and Therizinosaurs as well. A bustling world primed and ready for the next stage of dinosaur evolution that would never come. Before I go, I should explain the soft clickbait in the title depending on if I end up changing it after writing this. The lead author, Caleb Brown, wrote a marriage proposal to his then-girlfriend Lorna at the end of the acknowledgement section of the Regaloceratops paper. How sweet. Anyway, that's it. No more Regaloceratops have ever been found, or at least none that have ever been publicly acknowledged. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.